Hi, my name is Rick Bloodworth. This is the Common Sense Christian Channel, and today we're going to talk about our Founding Fathers. Understanding that whenever we refer to our Founding Fathers, while it's true that was certainly a patriarchal time uh, where the men really were the ones that were in positions of leadership, when we talk about our Founding Fathers, we really can't talk about them without talking about the women who influenced them as well. Uh, so many of our godly uh, men who served within uh, both the Revolutionary War and within government shortly after the nation was established were heavily influenced by their wives. Can you imagine uh, John Adams without Abigail Adams? And some of them were influenced by their godly mothers. You think about George Washington and the relationship that he had with his mother and the influence that he had towards becoming a Christian uh, and living a Christian life through his mother. And so, again, when we talk about our founding fathers, we really are talking about uh, the group of men and women who worked together to make this nation what it was. Well, when you think about what happened after the Revolutionary War and all the uh, blessings that America has seemed to enjoy since that time, you realize that the good beginning had a lot of momentum behind it. And that momentum carried forward for really over a hundred years. And it wasn't probably until maybe the, uh, the turn of the next century uh, in the 1900s, uh, going into World War I and then coming out of that and going into the Roaring Twenties. Uh, if you'll recall, Prohibition was enacted in the Twenties. And along with Prohibition came a lot of people who broke the law on that. They didn't particularly care for that law. And as, the, as is the case, when you have people that are that are lawbreakers, once you've broken one law, it becomes a lot easier to break others. And so the Roaring Twenties became a time that was very much unbridled as far as uh, law and especially as far as God's constraints on people. While we were still certainly uh, largely a Christian nation at that time, we had a lot more people who were openly starting to question God's authority. Some people were even turning to atheism, but others were just trying to shed uh, the constraints that they felt by being Christians. And so we had the flapper era and all the, uh, the speakeasies and all the different things that were going on in the 20s, uh, illicit gambling, all sorts of illicit conduct, and a, a rise in promiscuity during that time. Well, right after that, the Great Depression hit, and after the Great Depression, World War II hit, and it was during those hard times that people really started turning back to God. Our nation started turning back to God and recognizing Him a lot more openly than they perhaps had for a number of years. Uh, I always loved the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, and there's a part uh, within that movie where it talks about them gathering together at their churches on things like VE Day and, and Victory in Japan Day and, and offering prayers to God and offering thanksgiving to Him. Uh, even in Hollywood, they were acknowledging the fact uh, that this was a righteous nation or it was a nation that was returning back to righteousness. Well, after the victory was won in World War II and, and uh, the GIs came home, and we got to the, to the business of, of not just retooling our country, but rebuilding the world around us. And America became very prosperous. It's not surprising, perhaps, but it is very telling what happened during that time. Right after the war uh, was over, World War II, in 1946, the Supreme Court started issuing a series of uh, judgments that that started to slowly eliminate God from the public square, including our public schools. So much so that by 1963, it was no longer even legal to be praying in school or to have Bibles or to be teaching from Bibles in school. And uh, it was as if we took our prosperity and we took all of the blessings from the one that we had so earnestly prayed toward for safety uh, and now we want those blessings for ourselves, but we don't want any obligation from God. And so we start to see our nation deteriorate after that point. It was a slow deterioration, but it was a steady deterioration at that. I grew up in the 1960s. As a matter of fact, I lived in Seattle, Washington at the time, and I got to experience or at least observe the counterculture 
firsthand. This was the hippie era where it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And, and uh, along with, with these tossing off of restraints uh, came uh, the penalties of the promiscuity. It wasn't too long after all the uh, sexual revolution, as they called it, uh, that in 1973, America passed a law that, that began the legalization of abortion. And the nation just continued to go down from there. Uh, the drug use became to be more and more prominent, so much so that in recent years, a lot of uh, uh, cities, municipalities have just thrown in the towel, entire states, and they have legalized the taking of, of substances that used to be illegal. And so we're starting to see the consequences of that. I can tell you as one that grew up as a little boy in the 1960s with a lot of the freedoms that were available then, uh, that it was a much safer time. Uh, while it's true that there were people who were starting to go off, for the most part, we were righteous people. Most people still believed in God and, and were not ashamed to admit their belief in God. Uh, but that uh, is starting to change, isn't it? It wasn't uh, too many years ago that a president of the United States announced that we were no longer a Christian nation. And he wasn't saying that uh, with sorrow or repentance. He was instead boasting about that fact as if it was a good thing. But you look at where we are today, and I believe if you're paying attention, you can't help but notice that things have gotten out of hand and they've deteriorated to the point where concerned people ought to be even more concerned that if it continues that deterioration, that the nation's going to be lost. Well, all you have to do is review history to see this is so. I, I enjoy reading the Old Testament and, and reading uh, the history of, of the nation of Israel. And you see that when they started, they started off very strong. And while they had their ups and downs and they would leave God for a while and then they would come back, they still were, for the most part, trying to be a righteous people. Uh, when King David came along, uh, they were blessed so incredibly uh, abundant, with an, such an incredible abundance that they became a very rich and powerful nation. But then with this beginning with Solomon, they started to go away from their devotion to God. And as the years went by, the nation eventually uh, split into two uh, through civil war and, and a series of civil wars that kept them apart. Um, eventually, the northern part of Israel was taken over by Assyria. And, and less than 200 years later, the southern part with its capital at Jerusalem was taken over. Well, what had happened? And, and what had happened was this. A people who had been richly blessed turned aside their thoughts of God and started living for themselves uh, and ignoring God and ignoring his commandments, even, even to the point uh, where they were becoming involved with such levels of, of uh, hatefulness and promiscuity and shedding of innocent blood that it, the nation was no longer recognizable as it was when it started. Well, we look at Israel, and now we start looking at America and seeing what America has gone through and where America is at right now. And, and some of us are beginning to wonder, are we like Israel to where we might be coming to the point where God's just not going to put up with us any longer? Um, whatever your thoughts are on that, I think you have to admit that we have problems right now. Well, how do, you, how do we address those problems? And, and one of the best ways I have found is to go back and look at times when they were doing things right. And so I do want to go back to the time of the founders and look at some of the things that they did right. And today I want to talk about one of our specific founders, perhaps the most famous, and that's George Washington. And look at some of the characteristics that he had that made him such a great leader, and I believe made him so successful because he was blessed by God that the entire nation uh, ended up uh, enjoying the benefits of those blessings. So, George Washington obviously was born before the Revolution. He was born probably about 1731 or 1732, depending on, on the calendar. They switched the reckoning of the calendar not too long after that. But we recognize his birthday as, I, I believe, February 22nd of 1732. 
uh, he was he was a loyal citizen uh, of England and and even fought uh, as as a military uh, man in in the English wars that that the nation conducted itself in. But as England became more and more oppressive, George Washington uh, became more and more sympathetic to the plight of those who lived in America. And he was very much instrumental in taking part, uh, first in the Declaration of Independence, uh, where he was called upon by the First Congressional Congress uh, to, be, to be America's uh, commander-in-chief, if you will, as far as the general. And, and uh, he took that on. And America was very blessed because of that, because George Washington, from the time he was very little, uh, was raised in a very righteous setting. His father passed away when he was about 11, but his mother continued to raise him and make sure that, that uh, he had uh, Christian principles. Uh, she used to read to him not only from the Bible, but also from books on morals and values that really set in with him. So much so that when he was 20 uh, and going off uh, on his own, he kept a, a little prayer book. That This prayer book was found, I guess, about uh, 1891. Uh, so it would have probably been over a hundred years after he had written it when he was 20 years old. It was in the possession of the Washington family, and they were selling all sorts of relics from, from Washington's life, George Washington's life. And probably the most prized possession was this little prayer book that was written in George Washington's own handwriting. It was 24 pages long, and it contained about 20 prayers. And let me read one of those prayers. It will give you an idea of the mindset and the devotion uh, of uh, George Washington when he was a young man. This one is dated Sunday morning. And again, it's probably around when he was 20 years old, so probably around the year 1752, but Sunday morning. And he begins his prayer, Almighty God and most merciful Father. And then he says, Let my heart, therefore, gracious God, be so affected with the glory and majesty of it that I may not do my own works, but wait on thee and discharge those weighty duties that thou requirest of me. He's talking about the first day of the week. And since thou art a God of pure eyes, and will be sanctified in all who draw unto thee, who doest not regard the sacrifice of fools, nor hear sinners who tread in thy courts, pardon, I beseech thee my sins, remove them from thy presence as far as the east is from the west, and accept me for the merits of thy Son, Jesus Christ. And then he concluded the morning prayer by saying this, Bless my family, kindred friend, friends, and country. He's already thinking about the country, isn't he? And then he goes on to say, Be our God and guide this day forever for his sake, who lay down in the grave and arose again for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And then that Sunday evening, he wrote down another prayer, and this is what it said. O most glorious God in Jesus Christ, my merciful and loving Father, I acknowledge and confess my guilt in the weak and imperfect performance of the duties of this day. I have called on thee for pardon and forgiveness of sins, but so coldly and carelessly that my prayers are become my sin and stand in need of pardon. I have heard thy holy word, but with such deadness of spirit that I have been unprofitable and a forgetful hearer, so that, O Lord, though I have done thy work, yet it hath been so negligently that I may rather expect a curse than a blessing from thee. But, O God, who art rich, who art rich in mercy and plenteous in redemption, mark not, I beseech thee, what I have done amiss, Remember that I'm but dust, and remit my transgressions, negligences, and ignorances, and cover them all with the absolute obedience of thy dear Son, that those sacrifices which I have offered may be accepted by thee, in and for the sacrifices of Jesus Christ, offered on the cross for me, for his sake. Uh, ease me of the burdens of my sins, and give me grace that by the call of thy gospel I might rise from the slumber of sin into a newness of life. There have been some in modern times that have claimed that, that George Washington was little more than a deist, uh, that he believed in a God somewhere, 
but didn't really have any particular thoughts about him or any allegiance to him. But this prayer dispels that. He prayed to God through Christ. He recognized that the sacrifice of Christ uh, and the shedding of his blood on the cross was what was going to forgive him of his sins combined with God's grace. And so we see that George Washington was very much a Christian. He was practicing Christian. And he carried that through with him all of his life. I came across a story uh, not too long ago about a, a Quaker who had happened upon George Washington one time during the Revolutionary War. Well, now Quakers, uh, if you know anything about them, they are nonviolent. And so th this, this Quaker, like all others, wouldn't have been taking part in the war. As a matter of fact, he's identified as a Tory Quaker or somebody who would have had allegiance to the British throne. Um, he and his wife lived not too far from Valley Forge. As a matter of fact, their farm was just right close to where uh, the Revolutionary Army uh, had its winter quarters. And, and one day, when this man, who uh, by the name of Isaac Potts, was out walking, uh, he came across uh, a clearing and, and he heard a voice. And he was looking around, trying to figure out the, the source of that voice. And as he continued to explore and, and got a little bit closer, he recognized it was a man deep in prayer. And so he continued to go towards the sound of, of that voice, and he finally got to the point where he saw a man kneeling on the ground praying aloud, and he saw that it was George Washington. And, and he, so he just stood there quietly until George Washington was finished. And he said when, when Washington got up from the prayer, from the prayer, uh, that, that his face was just filled with, with such a serenity uh, that you could, that it just made, it moved this, this Quaker man. And so he didn't, he, he didn't stop George Washington or talk to him, but he did go home to his wife, Sarah. And this is, uh, this is part of the interaction that, that he and his wife uh, had when, when he got home. He said, Sarah, my dear Sarah, all's well, all's well. George Washington will yet prevail. Well, you can see, even though he was, uh, had an allegiance towards the British crown because he didn't believe in war, he also had a great deal of sympathy towards the revolutionary cause. And when he witnessed George Washington praying so fervently, he had an epiphany that this was something that was going to be very good for him. Well, his, his wife said, what's the matter? And she, she said, you seem moved. And he said, well, if I seem moved, it's because I am. And then he said this, Thee knows that I always thought that the sword and the gospel were utterly inconsistent, and that no man could be a soldier and a Christian at the same time. But George Washington has this day convinced me of my mistake. And then he related to his wife, Sarah, what he had seen. And they rejoiced in that because they felt like there was going to be hope for the suffering that was occurring in America at that time. Because they saw that George Washington, their leader, was not only a man of battle, but he was also, first and foremost, a man of God. And it gave them hope. And for good reason. Well, we know that the Americans won the Revolutionary War. Uh, that uh, George Washington became the first president. And uh, there, uh, at his inaugural uh, address, here is a, a brief passage from that. And I'm quoting from, from that address. After he talked about the fact that, that, he had, uh, uh, that nobody that was thinking could but help observe the fact that God was with uh, this young nation in its struggle for freedom, he said this, and this is where the quotation begins. We ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right, which heaven itself has ordained. And so as George Washington is talking about um, the nation and the blessings that they have received in becoming a nation, he points out that we're going to have to keep God's rules and his orders of what's right if we're going to continue to be a great nation. Uh, I got this uh, and several of these examples from the book George Washington the Christian. Uh, it was written uh, by, by a man named Johnson 
1890, uh, I think it was about 1899. Um, let me look, maybe it's 1919. I think it was in 1919. Uh, and what he was doing, he was trying to find a book, a resource that talked about George Washington's character and his Christianity, and he couldn't find one. So what he did was he went back to all the original sources he could find on all the writings about George Washington and the writings that George Washington had uh, made on his own, and he compiled them in a book that really did, in a very beautiful way, show what a tremendous man of faith George Washington was. Um, at George Washington's farewell address, or what we call his farewell address, when George Washington was stepping down, rather than, than get Congress together and make a, a big speech with pomp and circumstance and ceremony, he instead just wrote uh, an editorial or a letter uh, that was published in the Philadelphia newspaper. Uh, and this is a part of that letter, and it has become known as Washington's farewell address because he wrote it uh, in the form of a letter to a newspaper. He said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. And so he's essentially saying that if somebody was claiming to be a patriot, that was not recognizing the importance of religion, and he's talking about the Christian religion, make no, no doubt about that, but these supports of religion and morality, uh, if a man denied those, he couldn't be considered a patriot, is what he's saying. And then he said this, the mere politician equally with the pious man ought to respect and cherish them. Again, talking about religion and morality. He went on to say this, Let it simply be asked, where is the security for property, for reputation, for life, if the sense of religious obligation deserts the oaths, which are instruments of investigation in the courts of justice? In other words, when we're going to court, whether it's for a criminal or a civil case, if the oath that we take before God, swearing to tell the truth, so help us God, uh, has no meaning to the person giving that oath, uh, then everything will break down. He goes on to say this, Let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of peculiar structure, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Let me ask you this, does that sound like a man who believed in separation of church and state? Or is this a man who recognized the fact that anything the state could be only came about by the goodwill and the assistance of God? That certainly was, was his, his understanding. He goes on to say this, It is substantially true that virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government. The rule indeed extends with more or less in force to every species of free government. And so his, his point is this. A nation that tries to be righteous without God cannot accomplish that. And, and a people who, who claim to be educated but fail to recognize God in their lives cannot really make that claim. And furthermore, anybody that claims to be a patriot who does not recognize the importance of religion and morality uh, to the nation which he claims to be a patriot for is but a liar. He, he, he's fooling himself uh, if he's not trying to fool others. And so as we look at all that and as we see George Washington's devotion to God, his uh, propensity to pray and to pray with deep thought, um, with, with great meaning, um, as we see the fact that as he was a leader of this nation, both going into be at his beginning of becoming president, and eight years later when he was finished, he recognized God from the very beginning, and he reminded the people of God at the very end. He felt like this nation could only survive on the supports of religion and morality. And, and I think we're coming to find that this is true.
I mentioned that God was taken out of the public squares just pretty much completely in 1963 with the final Supreme Court ruling on that. Certainly, uh, prayer and the Bible were removed from the schools. Uh, in, in, in subsequent years, probably several decades after that, I remember when they started a program called Character Counts. And they tried to do this character counts because they were so distressed at the immorality, the lack of morality that the students were having as they were graduating and going in uh, to, the, to, the, to the workforce. And so they thought, we need to teach some type of morality. But well, they kicked God out, so what kind of morality? Well, they thought they could teach a character without God, a morality without religion. And we're seeing firsthand for ourselves that this cannot be. One of the reasons I think it's so important for us to go back to our roots, to our beginnings, and especially in a nation such as America, is because I believe we can be greatly encouraged when we see how righteous that the men and women were who founded this nation. There's no question that not everybody was a Christian who helped found this nation, but there's also no question from the, from the uh, documents that we have that nearly all of them were Christians, and they were the ones that swayed the nation to be what it was. Again, we've had a great deal of positive momentum because of their righteous conduct, not only in the winning of the Revolutionary War and the gaining of independence, but so many blessings have been given through the years uh, because of these righteous men and because of the righteous men and women who followed them and tried to maintain uh, this nation as being a Christian nation. But we're starting to falter in that, and we're starting to see serious consequences as a result of that. It's only when we get back to our roots, first as Christians, uh, to, to God and to His Word and start obeying that and living it as best we can, but also starting to recognize our history and where we came from so that we can understand why we were so successful so that we might be able to copy that as best we can in order that we might be successful again. Our main purpose is to get to heaven someday, but we're going to live in a physical world until then. I believe it's incumbent upon us, especially those of my generation, to try and do our best to return America to the righteous nation that it once was. If we can do that, I believe God will bless us richly. But if we don't, I know that because uh, there, is, there is a standard that God has always had, that if we abandon Him, He'll abandon us. And I know that if we continue to abandon Him, then we're going to lose the blessings that we've enjoyed for so long. God forbid that that ever happen. Let's do our prayerful best to make sure that we are a righteous people so that we can return to being a righteous nation again. That's all for today. I hope this has sound, gave you something uh, that will spur you on to study uh, and, and to deeper thought on this. But until next time, I appreciate your tuning in today. I pray that God will richly bless you in your efforts to serve Him.